Greetings. Good evening. Welcome to the gutter. Everyone ends up here eventually. It's only a matter of time. For those of you tuning in for the first time, having stumbled about this vacant and dare I say erudite corner of the YouTube pipeline, thank you. Herein, you will not find drama or self-aggrandizement, but actual content of the sort that I would actually watch myself, which, yes, is setting the bar low, but that is why we are called The Gutter. For those of you returning, thank you. I am Aldous, and I will be your host this evening. Uh, no guest, again, uh, our guest had to unfortunately cancel, so I threw this show together kind of at the last minute. And by the last minute, I mean I worked on it all week. Uh, this week uh, of Fathers and Friends, uh, authoritarianism versus independent anarchy, surrealism in all of its distilled true reality glory, a fever dream of sorts of cyberpunk merged with a bizarre pop culture credo, or in shorthand, all the metaphorical glory that can be condensed down into a rhinoceros in a swimming pool, or as it is colloquially known, Bruce Wagner and Julian Allen's Wild Palms. When we last left you, uh, whether you want to call yourself a gutterite or a gutterine, I guess for the seven or eight souls that are fans of this series, and depending on personal preference, the, the topic du jour was that of the underground and the independent comic response to the Comics Code Authority, the rebellious onslaught of material that pushed the boundary of acceptability and creativity. And tonight we, we continue that discourse in a fashion, with perhaps fashion playing more than just a parlor game of parlance amongst meanings. And, and that is quite literally perhaps at the heart of the matter, but arguably it is the heart that matters more. You see, when addressing intrinsic meaning into something that is wide open for massive interpretation, empathy plays a role in associating with the primary character. This is not a skill I am good at. Yet a good writer, though considered possibly endangered by the World Wildlife Federation standards in contemporary publishing, should always be able to manipulate the reader into following the yellow brick road to the Oz of their choosing, framing things out so that the reader arrives at the appropriate question formulated in their unconscious mind in such a fashion that they themselves, the, the reader, believe it to be wholly their own creation and not one that was subcutaneously implanted with all the violence of a proboscis being directly jabbed into their brain, left or right hemisphere aside for the moment. In short, you want them scratching their head, not at the open wound you left, but with the idea they themselves believe they formulated. So with all that being said, let me uh, here turn over to the chat and see who we've got here this evening. Uh, Eric Grant, always good to see you, sir. Thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure. We've got uh, Finatra, Woot, indeed. If ever there was anyone with a praying mantis as their icon, Finatra would easily be my favorite. And Belmont Press, Belmont Press, always good to see you, sir. Thank you for joining us here. And Jolly Green. Jolly Green, I believe this is the first time you... So uh, welcome to the gutter, my friend. Good to see you. So with those things, pleasantries and greetings being out of the way, let, it, let us set the table a bit further. By the late 80s, there was an, another sense of creative opportunity that arose across the board within the medium of comics itself. <clears throat> Due to the nascent success of many quote-unquote first-timers, um, that had preceded them, uh, some accomplished names began to kind of unfold into the realm of comics. Now, this is the era just before the disastrous formation of Image, uh, after the evolution of the comic book being about story, but directly associated with in-your-face art styles, but during the drive-up to the peak of the collector boom of comics. Releases of books during this era were actually on the nightly news, and thus people noticed people both in entertainment and other avenues. It is also worthy of note that most books in this era were on time, and that release schedule was something that was closely followed. This is important uh, in many ways. Because of the pre-digital highway time, entertainment did not come beamed through the windows of the soul on the back of a psychotic wave pattern. In order to get that kind of high, you had to leave your house and venture out into the real meat space world that required actual social skills and the ability to communicate beyond grunts and poorly drawn Pictionary sketches. Frightful thoughts for many of the Generation Z, I am sure. One of these individuals, slipshot and stumbling into the sea of swirling names, faces, and art styles, was a nascent novelist slash author slash essayist, Bruce Wagner. 
Now, better known probably as Rebecca de Mornay's former husband and a passing moment of respect for her fantastic work and risky business aside, who at the, the Wagner at the time of Wild Palm's release was a struggling but semi-recognized, as I said, essayist slash novelist who had a panache for associating transcendental stories of deeply flawed yet strikingly human characters through the deviant and contorted kaleidoscope of Hollywood's back alley swindling and depraved culture of entertainment on demand. A fixture of sorts in the chummed waters of the scripting land of Los Angeles scene of the mid to late 80s, Wagner had some bona fides that eleva elevated him a little bit amongst his contemporaries at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Probably, man, I, I don't know if you if it really counts, but elevated might be a strong word. I, I mean, if you were citing current year lo linguistics, you'd probably simply say that he had an IMDb page that had listed accomplishments, if, if not more importantly, um, for the long-term associations. Um, he had worked with Wes Craven on Nightmare on Elm Street's three script enough to earn a co-writing credit next to such luminous names as Craven himself, as well as Chuck Russell and the ever notable, if often shamefully disregarded Frank Darabont. Um, as is aforementioned to the marriage to the exquisite Rebecca de Mornay, because keep in mind, this is 1990, was in, uh, it was failing, it was in shambles, <clears throat> and uh, well headed into the inevitable finalization of divorce. What some would argue was his greatest work would come pouring forth in the page of, shockingly enough, Details Magazine in September of 1990. Now, it, it's not so shocking, perhaps, um, due to the previous setup, uh, comic strip, if not in book form, that it showed up in details. Um, details was a little bit of a, on the edge of the pulp culture razor, so to speak. And thus Wild Palms was released to a captivated, if not completely shocked and confused audience. Uh, it, it probably should be noted that while Wagner's prose is strung out across each panel, in a style that's more heavily contextualized by disjointed progressivism of a developed plot or story flow, uh, if you will, rather than a traditional unfolding narrative, the end result is something that is probably the closest parallel to something William S. Burroughs at his most sublime could write or Yevgeny Zamatin at his most eclectic. The, the graphic novel that emerged from this was was something that was unique. It was special. It utilized as the trope of an unreliable narrator to full effect. The main character of Henry Wyckoff is fundamentally here in the midst of a quote-unquote firewalk to draw a loose comparison to David Lynch's seminal work of Twin Peaks and the direct association their love of the Black Lodge that carries with it. Now, such comparisons are extremely difficult not to draw on some level, um, as we're in September of 1990 and Twin Peaks had premiered on ABC's network's affiliates earlier that year. The cultural wave that came after that was just completely all-consuming and likely a reason that this project, that of Wild Palms in particular, was ever greenlit at all. Now, complementing Wagner's narrative storytelling, st <coughs> storytelling tilings, stylings, yeah, I can talk tonight, in what can only be described as a, a Probably a lucid photorealistic art style is that of uh, illustrator Julian Allen. And it's it's majestic work that Allen does here. Um, while Wagner's ability to de delicately slice and alchemically transmute a sentence into something that's ethereally appropriate for the tone of the story is certainly a driving force behind wild why Wild Palms works so well. The real credit for the payoff goes entirely to Julian Allen's art. Uh, the path from his birth to the arguably completely non-prestigious pages of Details Magazine, uh, again, I mean, only in the 90s does something like this even fucking happen. But for, for Mr. Allen, um, he's something of a cross-section of the art community of that previously mentioned on last episode's 60s scene. And yet again, um, another bridge to that topic of the underground and the independent scene. Al albeit, this is much from... from uh, for more of a traditional art-oriented approach. And while the topic is worthy of discussion, certainly, for both its direct effect on the topic of tonight's show, as well as the interesting ripples that it caused throughout several mediums, <clears throat> it's probably best left for the sake of brevity, if nothing else, 
Uh, that to say that art students from the late 60s on were no longer being taught the skills necessarily to quickly and tastefully provide realistic scenes. Um, there was just something completely lacking in what was being taught. And so when when titans of industry, Milton Glaser and Clay Felker, uh, respectively graphic art and publishing names in their own right, depending on your particular reading choices and cultural reference, um, launched New York Magazine in 1968, uh, Alan was the first person they called to be the staff illustrator. The The job title appropriate is a, ex extremely appropriate for Alan, um, despite his work on Wild Palms in particular. Alan was very touchy with labels, uh, repeatedly being quoted in interviews and saying, I'm not an artist, I am an illustrator. And so that it was that Alan emerged, thanks to his acceptance of the job, into the New York art scene. And the rest, as they often say in circles like we are referencing, is history. Alan went on to do pieces for all the big press glossy magazines that decorate the edges of the newsstand. Esquire, Rolling Stone, Time, Newsweek, and on and on and on. But uh, present for both the uh, media exploitation of the Watergate events, as well as Ted, I'll have another Martini Kennedy's incident at Chappaquiddick. Uh, his pieces bookend stories with a note of flair and a sense of heightened realism. They really stood apart, uh, especially in the latter portions of the depraved decade of disco that is the 1970s. And I don't have to remind everybody that here in the gutter, we really only hate two things, communists and the 1970s. Um, by the 1980s, uh, Alan's work began to display some semblances that you see in the pages of Wild Palms. Uh, it's a light, slick, uh, rendered quality, almost dreamlike, that borders on, if not the bizarre, definitely the noir. Uh, he has a, a a way of shaping faces and using size to really convey meaning that goes beyond what you would expect of somebody that was simply an illustrator. Of his technical skill and other work, there is, I mean, absolutely no doubt when you see these pieces, which makes many of the choices for the interiors of wild palms in and of itself that much more enticing in a way it feels dirty and gritty it feels real it, it's the kind of thing you'd expect to see in the seedier parts of los angeles towards the dusk of the evening when the city's full bowels begin to slowly seep out at the edges of where the shadows dance between the buildings and this noticeable style indicates a familiarity with the darker aspects of the psyche and addiction was certainly a piece of alan's life so we could jump back to the chat real quick and see what's going on. We've got uh, some new arrivals. We've got Dean, Comics Big Dean, a uh, former guest of the gutter. And it's good to see you came back. You just couldn't stay away from the depravity. Good to see you, Dean. Always a pleasure. And we got some good chat here. No, Nobody appreciates history. That is That is a vicious lie, my friend. This entire show is dedicated towards the appreciation, understanding, and revelation of said history. Um, and as my viewer count goes, though, uh, you you seem to have the one up. So checkmate, good sir. Checkmate. And Eric Grant says, I appreciate the disco hate. See, and this is this is why we're all friends right there. But moving on, by, by 1990, the, the demons of Alan's past had been mostly put to bed. Um, Julian had had kind of found a good groove. He was getting consistent work. And it was around this time that the editor for Details Magazine, uh, Derek Unglis, who was an old friend from their younger days in England when they were both art teachers, um, reached out with a project for him to collaborate on. And that project was Wild Palms. Now, there's many things that you can say about Wild Palms. But I think the first thing you need to ask is just a simple question. What is it? So Wild Palms is, if it's remembered for anything, it's more than likely being remembered for being an ABC miniseries that aired in May of 1993. And that's because of the marketing that directly associated it with executive producer Oliver Stone. Um, nobody really remembers the two to three pages in Details Magazine that sourced its benign creation. Um, for whatever, for, And that can be a positive or a negative, depending on how you look at it. When the series debuted in May of 93, a graphic novel was released uh, through Arrow that was uh, received warmly, but limitedly. 
Um, and while this isn't really surprising due to the infatuation that contemporary culture carries with, I guess, digital entertainment over the written word, which I guess, you know, if I may editorialize a little bit on my own show, it is more likely to be cited by future anthropologists as one of the table legs that called our culture's descent into depravity, ignorance, and the general dustbin of history than anything else. Um, it it does frame out things quite nicely when you consider the manner uh, that this is how most people heard about Wild Palms via the miniseries rather than the actual comic. I mean, for starters, you got to understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about the early 90s. And at, at a time now, this is three decades removed, and it carries a certain level of nostalgia, um, unlike few others before it mainly due to just the influence of the fewer avenues of entertainment. Um, I mean, one such giant at the time was MTV, where Condé Nast, the owner of Details magazine, spent considerable revenue actually promoting details and commercials. Um, and come uh, the autumn of 1990, uh, those commercials actually included uh, references to Wild Palms, uh, which is, as far as I know, a first. So... You don't wear your father's clothes. You don't drive your father's wheels. You don't listen to your father's music. And Details isn't your father's magazine. Details is a smart, irreverent, fresh alternative in men's magazines written from a younger point of view with interviews that go deeper than just finding out what someone's favorite color is. Music reviewers that open your ears to new sounds much before anyone else. And when it comes to fashion, Details always has the hottest new styles, from sneakers to suits to baseball caps, plus sports, news, politics, and comics like Wild Palm. In other words, all the things you care to know about are inside Details magazine every month. Call me all the things you care to know about are in Details magazine every month, including Wild Palms. One of the first instances of a comic actually being used to sell a non-comic magazine. Um, again, a footnote, but an interesting one nonetheless. And the first thing that you that strikes out from those pages of Wild Palms that they show, um, and anytime you pull up any page of Wild Palms, is the work that Julian Allen's art is just poured into it. Uh, you look at those pages, um, and they're, it's harping, if not directly mimicking the styles of so many classic stuff. I mean, Rob Kickregard's rock opera from Heavy Metal immediately comes out, in my mind, when you look at it. And this was a series that ran for years um, in Heavy Metal. So when anybody that's in and related to the art scene is seeing this, they're immediately knowing the tones that Alan is going to kick. And um, those tones just fit so well with what Wagner's was doing with the script. And it's the, it's the almost photorealism of the art. I mean, at this time, it's just, it, like I said, it's a standout. You, you don't see this kind of art unless you're talking about heavy metal and maybe juxtapose and two or three other very, fairly eclectic referentials. It's not the kind of thing that your average person that's going to be picking up details is used to consuming. And there's an intoxicating nature about it. Um, it's almost, it, it, it slightly predates Dave McKean pastiching the images um, uh, for his covers, but it's like Alan does it with contemporary film and television included within the panels and arrangements themselves. Um, and while at first it might be a little jarring, um, the, the deeper one delves into the paranoid delusionary themes of Wild Palms, the more the art seems to entrap you within the world, uh, suggesting that maybe just possibly main character Harry Wyckoff's journey is one the reader is either riding along with or perhaps actually involved in. It's a deep sense of the walls are closing in, and it, it presents itself all the more as you progress through Harry's tale as he descends into madness. Or arguably a stark understanding of reality, depending on your particular particular interpretation of the, the source material. A Alan's uh, use of close-ups in particular is, is worth of note. Um, it, it just seems that it, it's almost, almost psychedelic um, in how he pushes 
he pushes you forward and deeper into what uh, one reviewer described it as uh, a delicious claustrophobia that amps up the paranoia. Um, and so re returning back to that initial question, uh, what is Wild Palms? It's a meandering, lazy river ride. that it, it exists somewhere between the world that Hunter S. Thompson witnessed between the thin tint of his glasses and like skip williams's art uh from the 60s it's it's a fever dream that would just be as suited in its own clothes as it would be the topic of an early 80s progressive rock concept album it exists in its own world of the of the 1990s but still has callbacks to that post miami vice cocaine fueled neon landscape that's edged with just a bit of the old ultra violence and because of this, it's certainly not for everybody. But if you ask anybody here just off the farm, off Orwell Lane, it, it's probably why we fucking like it so much. Because it's not for everybody. It's not easily accessible. It's something you actually have to dig in and chew on to even kind of pull out meaning from. Yes, there's superficial meaning that you can garner after one read. But when you look at a page like this, there's... And we're going to get into even more. There, there's something beyond just that superficial. There's, there's meat here. There's, there's intrinsic meaning. So Wild Palms is the narrative journey of, of Harry Wyckoff. He's a professional lawyer in the entertainment scene. He lives in an isolated suburban reality that features the, well, an, an absent nature of his participation with his family or his career and the world around him. He floats through life. None of which, I mean, aside from a general dependence upon prescription medication, more for stability of mind than body is actually real. His family is not his family. His job is not his job. And the man he actually works for is a corrupt senator who owns a media empire and is the leader of a cult that suspiciously resembles Scientology in form, if not function, and actual name. Thetans obviously need not apply. The setting, if you can call it that, um, is a, a shifting ground of what is reality and what is dream. And it's it's someone slowly tripping their balls off, man. It, it's firmly set in the time of its publication. It's got direct references to the ascendancy of Bill Clinton and his uh, administration, it's got the social ramifications, both passively and, uh, and non-passively, of uh, mentioned with Rodney King's beating and trial. <clears throat> and eventually, towards the end of the series, there's actual self-referential comments, uh, including a meeting between Jim Belushi and the character of Harry in the comic itself, Belushi having portrayed the character in the miniseries. I mean, if ever there was anything that could be suggested to be Inception-like before Nolan's groundbreaking film, it could very well be this work that Wagner and Allen accomplished. Belushi is not only, is, he's not the only named celebrity either to fill in roles. Uh, Carrie Fisher uh, famously appears in the book as well, um, as a, both as a favor and a friend of Wagner. But the... Uh, the story is its ebbs and flows of balanced surrealism and codified paranoia. And it's, it's laid across three distinct arcs and each arc follows basically a calendar year of publication. Uh, the first covers the 90 to 91 publication years and really establishes Harry's character. Um, all the falsehood and lies uh, within the narrative structure. And it, it, it does this delicately before slowly pulling back um, the layers of the onion to reveal the core of the obsessive self-reflective terror that's actually occurring in here. And make no mistake about it, there are layers of terror here. Um, it introduces Harry's wife, Beth, who's a fashion designer, his son, Cody, his daughter, Deidre. These are the core establishment of his world. Um, but it's a facade. Um, that innocent family structure is important for the deconstruction of Harry's psychosis. If you don't have that innocence, the deconstruction is not nearly as effective. And it works so well here. Um, the disappearance of his childhood friend, Tommy, and the emergence of his high school girlfriend, Paige, 
are kind of the driving factors that push the journey forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. Almost as if he's he's pushing Sharon's boat out across the river Styx. Only Harry's the only passenger, and he's two cents shy of the toll. Um, there's moments of normalized violence that are patterned next to the boring life of a suburbanite in stark fashion. In this sequence, at a party, Harry's mother-in-law gouges out the eyes of a renowned artist and fellow guest that's there, um, followed by her also drugging Harry, um, and the resultant hallucinogenic trip begins the catharsis for the character. And uh, it, it it is also important. That's the first appearance of the rhino. Um, if there's anything that's like a harken back or a callback to the 60s that we were talking about last week, it's this random boom, here's a rhino just in the middle of the story. And it gets weirder from there. Uh, Felix Haas has joined us. Greetings, sir. Always a pleasure to see you. And uh, Dean says, I can feel that coat. Well, man, the visceral imagery only gets more associated associative as we go through this for sure uh harry's changes um both in mannerism and like i said this this general psychosis only continue uh to accelerate um he changes careers he goes from working for his law firm to an employee of the notorious wild palm agency and uh herein his friend tommy reappears wearing a different face uh, tommy shows harry a doorway at the bottom of his pool and the series of uh, secret tunnels that it leads to. And this kind of starts off an accelerated descent. Um, it kind of closes off arc one, if you will. And then the, the establishment of Harry's world has been complete. And we've introduced, uh, now we'll, we're going to introduce the opposing forces that operate on either side of that world. The fathers of the Wild Palms group, and the friends of the resistance against this pseudo-religious cult that's infecting society. Again, that authoritarianism versus independence, but it's brought to you wholesale in a manner that Rod Serling could be proud of. And it culminates in the introduction of perhaps one of the oddest characters in the series, the, the Maps to the Stars Boy, a child with tattoos of stars all over his body. <laughs> and as the closing bell rings, as the first arc fades into a nothingness sea, uh, Beth, Harry's wife, has gone missing and Harry is arrested for her murder. And I think <clears throat> on that point, as I cough a little bit, I am uh, <clears throat> going to take a quick intermission. Excuse me. Yeah. When Pressman toy makers looking for something new, the secret they brought back for you is incredible. The Pressman Witch Doctor Head Shrinkers Kit. Plastic flesh, mixing cauldron and petrifying potion. Just pour it into the mold and in minutes you can add monster hair. Paint it with a coloring kit included or make up your own decorations. In 24 hours, the heads shrink, shrink down. Now, shrunken heads for all occasions. Collect them, swap them, give them to your witch doctor friends. You can always cook up more with Pressman's Witch Doctor Head Shrinkers Kit. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back. So kind of going back to that closeout of the initial discussion on season on arc one if you will that first year that 90 to 91 metaphor and allegory are played to the nines uh, this is a book that firmly establishes it says it, it establishes itself as anything but light reading uh, illusion is used in every frame to convey something beyond the story's meaning it's i mean think of it as a rubik's cube and with each twist, you're opening new possibilities and changing patterns of meaning. There are times it even feels like Wagner and Allen are channeling something beyond what the text is drawing across. In, to a large degree, you want this book to mean more than it probably really does. And that is such a fantastic accomplishment that it alone would be worthy of note. But wait, there's more. We, we've still got two thirds of the run to go. 
as the middle arc opens, and this covers again the 91 to 92 publication years, changes were coming for both the series and the future. Uh, ABC had greenlit a miniseries to catch on the proverbial wave of the continued t- Twin Peaks cultural phenomenon. And more importantly, Oliver Stone had signed on to executive produce the miniseries. Uh, the hype for this thing was at an all time high. And this might have changed where Wagner was headed. We won't know because he doesn't speak about it. But when we open, uh, the, the stories revealed that Harry's arrest was nothing more than a pretext for the Wild Palms agency to have him interrogated and reinitiated as a member uh, by his still living wife, his mother in law, and Paige, his ex girlfriend from high school. Uh, they also further reveal that Senator Kreutzler is the head of the agency itself, as well as the head of the cult of synthiotics, uh, this religion come consumerism philosophy uh, that's at the control of the agency. And uh, the senator's political aspirations and the cult, everything's built on this. And when I say earlier that there is no light allusion to Dianetics and Scientology, I'm not kidding. It's tissue thin metaphors uh, apparent to anybody that wants to see it. They're right there before you. Um, but Wagner and Allen have, are, they firmly established some guideposts to kind of guide you forward. So Harry, having been uh, interrogated, having been abused both mentally and physically and sexually uh, during his time, where he's been imprisoned by the Wild Palms, uh, he begins to have a a religious awakening of sorts. Um, And returning to the doldrums of the everyday, uh, Harry is now firmly convinced that his family is not his own. Um, All of them have been replaced by duplicates or they are actual imposters. And his attentions drift even further away from what's occurring around him and his family. And he pours himself into his work, which at this time is... uh, a production of a movie called Maps to the Stars as if you needed another allusion to what he is actually seeking. Um, new characters are introduced, both friends and fathers alike, uh, the most important of which is uh, Chicky Stein. And he's, uh, he's a fatal character that's dying of cystic fibrosis. Um, but he's developed uh, this finalized tremendous jump into a new virtual reality immersion system and it's hoped uh, that it can bridge the existential gap between the the human wetware and the, the telepresence of entertainment. And there's, while the story itself here kind of, it honestly, it starts to fray a little bit. Um, it's almost like we've got the development of too many cross plots and you're starting to get some random collisions that just don't make sense. But the, the momentum stays moving forward for the most part into Harry's continued slide into this oblivion. And if anything, it's now much more with a stark flair than existed in the first arc. And this second arc concludes again with the rhino, um, the pool passageway, and Harry packing a bag and disappearing into the tunnels. The third and final act is covered in the 92 to 93 publication years and firmly aligned with the release of the miniseries of the show itself. The the story opens with Harry as almost a completely broken man and uh, living in a synthiotics convalescence home of sorts, almost like he's been fully embraced and adopted what the cult had to offer. He's reading Senator Kreutzler's books on synthiotics philosophy and living with his fellow inmate slash resident slash cult member slash believer slash girlfriend. Um, And it's, it's in this blending of the real and the wild palm realities. Um, It kind of begins to cross over there. Here's where Jim Belushi visits Harry to get an idea of the character he'll be playing in the miniseries. Dana Delaney, who plays Beth in the miniseries shows up in the book. Um, It's like Harry's pseudo dream is like a walking nightmare come full circle. And he's, he's talking to the man that will be playing him in his own show. He realizes he needs to close the loop, so to speak, to get anywhere. And so as, as the series reaches its ultimate conclusion, Harry begins to reestablish something and he closes the various avenues that were explored and left open and Wagner does an excellent job of this. Every open plot thread is handled with a deft hand. 
So he goes back and tries to connect with his son, or at least the very least who he initially thought was his son, Cody, um, who has now established a path to taking over the Wild Palms Agency. Senator Kreutzlitzer's heir apparent, if you will. Um, but he's, Harry still suffers from that same distance that was present before any of this started. If you go back to arc one, that, that hesitant distance he had towards his son still remains. He goes and visits Paige. And whereas before there was a, a passion and a longing and a huge sense of guilt because he had those feelings, but yet Beth was still the love of his life. He finds Paige dying of AIDS. And um, she informs him that his mother-in-law strangled Beth to death and that his daughter Deidre is to marry Cody to become Synthiotic's royalty. And something intrinsically for the first time in the book seems to snap inside Harry because he's even more despondent than he's ever been before. And yet he's at his most absolute real too. It's like the remaining connections to the last vestiges of reality that were he was loosely holding on to. Uh, both his conscious and his self-identity have been snipped completely. And Peter, the, the boy with the, the star tattoos, who's his actual son, um, meets up with Harry and provides him a gun. And together, he Peter guides him to do what he has to do to close this loop. And so they go to Senator Krulitzer's house to kill the prophet. And... Harry doesn't shoot him. He ends up beating the man to death uh, before injecting himself with an overdose of drugs. And <clears throat> while dying, uh, has a hallucination, a beautiful end of this fever dream of a book. His, his existence ends on it, of this picturesque life that he had way back at the beginning. And the isolation and fulfillment of climaxing inside his wife being the last memory he clings to as visions of his family and safety and the passion and embrace with his now deceased wife are there. And it's this, this excellent ending. It, it paints this glorious picture because it defines the subtle layers of paranoia and insanity and pop culture and the economics of mid nineties, Los Angeles and the entertainment industry. It's all laid bare, right? It's, it's the depravity of an industry. It's the meat grinder of the personality. It's, it shows you how fragile all of our senses of self are. And it's on full display. You watch a man fall, nude, rude, and in every sense of each of those words. No reason is given for the multi-layered conspiracies that are laid throughout the book um, that, or that even Harry takes a part in. Um, for there's there's no real reason viscer viscerally appropriate enough to even rationally explain them. It's it's the brutality of reality on display. It's shifting identities. It's doppelgangers. It's dark shrouds of souls harvested for nothing other than the pleasure of taking everything all fully laid out like a table set for dinner, but never ne foods never put down. Wagner and Allen don't pull any punches now, and fair enough. They don't land many either. Um, in a work like this, you don't have to. It, it's not a bout. It's not a fight. You're not trying to fight the reader. It's a wooing. Um, it's dinner in a movie with a little romp in the back seat, but just enough, just enough of a romp that you have to get the interior detailed the next day. And Monday morning, that lingering smell never quite left the cabin. There's a, it's a heavy musk. It's, it's not the kind of book you talk about in polite company. Nor is it the type of thing that most people want to read. But once you start, you can't put it down. It draws you in and it becomes something more. It's a piece that needs more attention, but will never get it because of the very fact of what it is. It's almost like there's too much truth there. And I'm sure Wagner didn't intentionally just make it that way to make it more surreal. But to anybody that pays attention, there's more than even a balance of the truth of the edges of the entertainment industry. And you need not look any farther than page one, where the statement is made that Cody is already five. It's a miracle that he hasn't been molested yet. This gives an intrinsic understanding of what Wagner is talking about. And it's laid bare throughout the entire concept of the book. I think Harry represents the reader in the most offensive and foul way that is rarely done and even more rarely accomplished with any tact. 
Harry is passive. He floats through the story and is incapable of changing the path he is on. He doesn't initiate any action. He accepts that which occurs around him, guiding his false sense of choice, and lives an empty, almost fruitless existence, a pinball, bouncing through a game controlled by somebody else. Harry is nothing more than the bleakness of the indifferent in the face of the salamcrum of his existence, full of anxiety and pharmacological solutions above all else. The orange bottle with the childproof cap, no different than an orange life vest than an open sea for somebody that can't swim and refuses to learn. Harry is an indictment against those that re refuse to acknowledge what season it is, what day it is, and just float through their life. So what is Wild Palms? It's a chimera of mixed messages that slowly shift and change into patterns. It's a fucking metaphor. It's an allegory. It's an illusion. It's nothing and something all at the same time. It's both an indictment of the industry it was meant to be celebrated upon and an orgasmic thrill ride of that very thing. It was made into a miniseries, for Christ's sake, and they're indicting the industry that celebrated them. It has a rational self-interest that is firmly checked at the door, and no receipt is given for pickup later, yet it still remains. What is Wild Palms? It is the comic that inspired the miniseries that was more of an event than the actual series itself. And 30-odd years later, it remains at the edges of the zeitgeist while the comic has been all but forgotten. Perhaps it was the first attempt to push a comic into a film deal. Perhaps it was something that predated digital social commentary. Either way, it's a ride, man. One that I suggest you punch your own ticket and jump on at your next available opportunity. Thank you for joining me tonight. This has been The Gutter. This is blood for blood and part of gallons. This is the old day, and the bad days, the all or nothing days. They're back. There's no choices left.
you're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.